So I have a, a bundle of your own questions here. Uh, the, 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 they come under the category of sovereign annuities and DC Plus to, to probe it in more detail. So let me introduce our panel. You're familiar with David, uh, David, uh, CEO of Irish Life Corporate Business, is our initial speaker. Uh, Lachlan um, is the gentleman nearest to him. Uh, Lachlan is uh, a lawyer and has worked with Lachlan Deegan. He is a senior advisor with IBEC. So he's here to give the employer response to what you've heard. Uh, he uh, is an employment rights and pensions legal eagle. Uh, he's worked with IBEC for a number of years, having qualified as solicitor in 2001. So, you know, he served in the Attorney General's office. So he's here really to give the employer perspective. Uh, next, we have uh, Maureen. Maureen Dolan is, uh, many of you will know her. She's a partner uh, with McCann Fitzgerald. She leads the pensions and investments group there. And she's advised many companies, statutory bodies, other multinational organisations, as well as trustees on their legal obligations in relation to uh, uh, pension requirements. She's delivered papers at seminars. She's a member of the IAPF, uh, the Irish Pro Share Association. Um, and, and she is really here to give us you know, legal definitions and the do's and don'ts of where the law is in relation to some of these transitional arrangements. And we have a man who needs no introduction, Alan Broxon, who has been part of the uh, furniture and pension landscape for some 47 years uh, with the Irish Pensions Trust. Um, <laughs> I'm, even, I'm even exhausted reading out all the things. He's been chairman of the European Federation of Retirement Provision, past chairman of the IAPF. He was a member of the National Pensions Board. And Really, he hasn't earned a decent living all his life. But uh, Alan is here to give uniquely the trustee perspective. And, you know, I, I was, certainly it doesn't look like a career option for me, trustee. It is really onerous responsibilities here. OK, let, maybe could I start with you, Alan? Um, your reaction to the launch of these two products, you're very familiar with the world of change. Did they, did they attract your interest? Yes, indeed. I should say, first of all, that I would agree you wouldn't make a good trustee. You take far too many bloody risks, as far as I can see. Um, <laughs> here, here. <laughs> I, I can see how this is going to go. <laughs> well, I can say you, 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 you mentioned quite rightly I've been 46 years doing it. And it, it, that 46 years passed before my eyes because I remembered when I joined IPT, every bloom and pension scheme we had was based on deferred annuities. And of course, I think it was 1974, Irish Life introduced their managed fund, and the world as we know it came crashing around our ears. And just it's great to see the fair annuity back. And it's also interesting to see that some of the actuaries think it's a new product. <laughs> Far from it. Far from it. If you wait around long enough, yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay. and, and, and of the two, of the two, which caught your eye more? Of the two which? Of sovereign annuities or DC plus? Well, I mean, you know, they're horses for courses. I mean, we've been waiting for sovereign annuities for God knows because there are certain pension schemes out there hanging in waiting for the introduction. And I really can't understand why between the industry and Auntie May we haven't had something sensible brought forward yet. I mean, it's mad. Uh, but, you know, we need them, and we need them pretty quickly. Not in every case. We'll be talking later, presumably, about, you know, what trustees' attitude should be. That's a whole different... And, and on the here. question of, of transition, of winding up an existing fund, is the actual transition itself, is, is that fraught with difficulty? It is. I mean, the reality of it is that, you know, the employer, the, 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 the trustees are deeply involved in this. I mean, there are pension schemes where the employer has the upper hand. He can very virtually wind up tomorrow and doesn't have to worry too much about the trustees. But equally, there are others where the trustee or, or the employer has to give notice. Now, that's a whole different ball game if he has to give notice because, you know, there's lots of steps we have to go through before we even begin to think of sovereign annuities. And the thing to bear in mind from a trustee perspective is, I mean, the one thing I do know about a trustee is we don't lose too many cases in court, but by golly do we spend a lot of money defending our actions. And the reality is that there's nothing in the legislation that absolutely gives the trustees carte blanche on sovereign annuities. We have to show that we've acted as trustees, that we've acted honestly, and we've acted reasonably. Every case has to be looked at at its merits. There are cases where we can do it. Maybe there are cases where we have to do it. 
But equally, there are cases, if we did it, I think we'd end up in court. And I think, you know, we have to flesh this out. But each case has to be looked at at its merits. And different solvency levels will dictate a different approach. OK, Alan. Uh, Maureen, uh, a legal perspective on what you've heard this morning. I think that they add two, two uh, further elements to the discussions that have been going on. In the last number of years, in our experience, employers and trustees have been grappling with change programmes, which included pensions, and also lately with the pensions levy. And I think now we're at the beginning of the discussion on where these kind of approaches can fit into that discussion. And the trustees and employers will look at those on a scheme-specific basis, and they're very serious options. It is very difficult for... Uh, conversions from DB to DC to, to be placed within an organisation and allowed to go on into the future as it has in the past. So this may help uh, that discussion in, in some instances. The sovereign annuity carries its own risks, its own solutions. So under trust law, uh, trustees will have to take advice, will have to look at it in the context of their own scheme. The uh, advice will look at the, the investment side because a lot of this is around investment, also with actuarial advice, and then the protections that Alan has spoken about from a legal perspective. So yes, I, I think they will add to the discussion. And, and would it be your cornerstone advice to employees, trustees listening here today to get independent advice? Well, the uh, trustees will always have their own advisors and employers will have theirs. Uh, the independent advice comes in at the employee level where you're asking them to take uh, certain decisions that where, especially where risk moves from the employer to them and that is always part of the discussion whether or not employees should be encouraged to go and get independent advice and whether that is uh, who is going to pay for that but certainly the trustees in, in uh, more recent years have had to get separate advice from the employer in many instances because the agenda is different for both and they're each looking, they each have a role to play and that advice needs to focus on that role. Lachlan, Deegan, um, you know employers are under a lot of pressure out there, the context uh, of this is cost cutting, you know, to be competitive at every level in every business. Um, did you see attractions in the schemes put forward this morning? Well, absolutely. I think from the point of view of employers, the two products, and particularly the sovereign annuity piece, is something that we've been uh, looking for, uh, for for quite some time. We're certainly very supportive of the idea since it's been floated by SAI and IBF and others. And we, we also always thought that the um, the minimum funding standard shouldn't have been restored until sovereign annuity products were available so that the schemes could assess that option in particular as one of the, the elements in the toolbox uh, uh, to, to, to solve problems that are there. Because we wouldn't just see it from the cost point of view, although that's a massive issue, obviously. There's also the workplace relations point of view as well. Because bearing in mind, any proposal to change the schemes, essentially breaking the promise that you made to the employee on the day that they started. They started their... their, their work with you. They signed a contract which said they would get a certain pension entitlement. And now you're coming back and saying, we think you should look at something different. And uh, albeit that in some cases, and, and, and some of the speakers showed that there may be some advantages to moving perhaps to DC plus, it's still going to be perceived by employees that there is something funny going on here. And there's a big um, communication risk which has to be done and has to be packaged in the workplace. So I suppose there's two elements that, that I'm talking about. One is is the product the right product? And, and there seem to be two very exciting options there. But secondly, it's how do we sell that to the, particularly the active members that would be the people that would be to the forefront of, of our minds on a day-to-day -day basis. Can everyone hear at the back? Yeah, okay. It, is, there, is there a preliminary question to the transition? Who's going to fund the deficit? Well, that's, that, that's always the question there. Uh, has that been resolved in a lot of cases or not? No. I would say the answer is no. I mean, it's been resolved in a number of cases, but I think the, the suspension of the minimum funding standard kind of froze in aspic the, the, the debate that had been going, and perhaps some, some progress may have been made in, in 2010 uh, along those lines. Some schemes got it over the line. Most schemes didn't, and in a lot of cases, we had a kind of a, a holding of position from late 2010 till now. And what, what these proposals, the particular sovereign annuity end of it, will do would be to, to bring in an extra element to the discussions won't, they won't win any arguments, but it will allow extra uh, kind of um, uh, tools to be brought to bear on the problem. Okay. Well, look, I have your questions here. I have a bundle here on sovereign annuities. Now, some of these, David, are for you because okay. they're unanswered questions. Sovereign annuities. How will defaults operate in practice? Um, well, I think 
Well, I suppose as I explained, the risk fully passed through to whoever the policyholder is. So if the scheme owns the asset, it passed through to the scheme in the first instance, or if the policy is owned by the pensioner, it's passed through to the pensioner. I suppose, as Shane explained, our products initially will be just based on French bonds and Irish bonds, and what that allows us to do is, I suppose, construct for portfolio of bonds that are fully matched to, to the pension payments. So these will be special flat bonds. So largely, if a default happens there, say it could be a haircut, so say if there's a 20% haircut applied to the payment on those bonds, there would simply be a 20% haircut applied to the pension. Um, a more complicated type of default might be, well, we're not going to do a level hair put, cut, but we're going to suspend payments for three years. So our policy will allow us to suspend payments to pensioners in that circumstance for three years. Now, probably what we would offer pensioners in that situation is some option to commute forward some of their future payments to cover them over those three-year periods. But, but they're the type of ways that it would work. Okay, I have a question here. And feel free, any of you, to come in on this because we're going to rattle through them. Why the focus on Irish bonds in the context that, you know, one of the things that employees can look forward to is the state pension, the old age pension, the retirement pension. Uh, as the state pension is backed by the Irish state, is there not an element of imprudence by sovereign annuities involving 50% Irish bonds? With 6%, and secondly, with 6% yield, is 6% yield enough for Irish bonds? Diversification benefits involving Belgium, Spain and Italy. Why didn't you pick those states? Yeah, they're, they're very good questions. So, like, first of all, diversification is the big argument against sovereign bonds and there's no, or sovereign annuities, and there's no getting away from that. If you have a sovereign annuity 100% constructed in Irish bonds, you're totally concentrated in that, you know. So there's no, you know, the diversification is a very valid argument uh, against that. But, you know, as I explained, there'll be situations in wind-ups, there'll be situations where employers want to move away that they may actually put up with uh, at that risk and, deal, you know, consider it an appropriate thing to do. The question about using other markets like Belgium or Italy or that, they're interesting and we get asked that all of the time. There's two disadvantages there. One is the bond markets in those countries are not as well developed as France where we, where we have the type of bonds that we need to construct the product. And the NTMA will also offer those bonds in Ireland. So it's actually very technically difficult to construct a sovereign annuity based on Belgian bonds or Italian bonds because the markets there are not developed and sophisticated enough. And I think there's also another sort of practical reason. Um, we all live in Ireland and we can take a sort of an assessment of judgment ourselves as to what we think is the default risk in Ireland. Like imagine sitting down with a pensioner and saying we're going to have an annuity that is some way linked to Belgium. Like our pensioners don't live in Belgium. They don't know the first thing about Belgium. They can't make any assessment of Belgium. So predominantly what we see is sovereign annuities built on Irish bonds. If people don't want to take the full risk on that, they can blend it so they can use a mixture of sovereign Irish bonds and then fully guaranteed, and that's the way they can manage the risk. Okay, in a sovereign annuities buyout, who gains if the underlying sovereign bond returns to close to investment grade, the pensioner or the life office? Uh, ultimately, the pensioner, because I suppose if the yields declined on Irish bonds, that will mean that the investment world considers Ireland is moving to be a safe place and the risk of default is happening. So in, in that scenario, the risk of default is reducing and it's the bench, pensioner that benefits. OK. Uh, traditionally, guaranteed deferred annuities have been expensive. Will it be possible to purchase a guaranteed deferred annuity in DC Plus based on a sovereign bond? Um, not initially. Sovereign bonds are only available to people at retirement. Uh, now, one of the things we might look at is that you purchase your secured pension on yeah, the conventional deferred annuity, but you have an option to convert that at retirement into a sovereign annuity. But it would just have to be an option at retirement, not at outset. Uh, Maureen, I might ask you, or, or Lachlan, will sovereign annuities be available for DC plans? Well, that's a product uh, decision. But there's no reason to see why it could not. If, uh, but again, it would be based on investment advice. There's nothing in the legislation which prevents that. So, yes. Would that be an option to do a, a yeah, mix? It's certainly something. Like, I suppose for us, we have to get the product out there first and establish the product. So you know, the big market for us initially is to find benefit schemes because that's where the value on for retirements are. But if we can get the product out there and get the product established, yet yeah, we'll be looking to extend it as an option. Okay. For here, here, here's a legal question and also perhaps a, a trustee question. In a DB wind-up, where a pensioner is already receiving 100, would it be legally okay to offer a choice of a sovereign annuity of 100, linked to Irish bonds, or a traditional guaranteed annuity of 80? So what are the legal obligations there? 
Well, on wind-up, if the pensioner was receiving €100 Euro the day before the wind-up, they're entitled to €100 Euro after the wind-up, provided there are enough funds there. So at the point where you're securing it, you're securing €100. Euro. Uh, now, we were discussing whether or not uh, something different can happen after that, but that is the current law. Could you offer a choice in that circumstance, Alan? I mean, the issue here is one for the Pensions Board. I mean, in principle, I don't see any reason why not, but there are rules. I mean, the reason I would say why not is, I mean, for example, if somebody is entitled to a pension of 100 and says, by the way, there's no spouse's pension, I want to give up something to provide for my spouse, I see no reason why we couldn't do that. So, you know, there's no reason in the world other than rules that prevent this, and I think that's a matter for clarification with the Pensions Board. Here's one for you, Alan. How should trustees address the communications challenges of sovereign annuities to pensioners? Huh, with great difficulty. <laughs> I, I, I think, yeah, that, that, is the, that is really the big problem. I mean, trustees have to go through the pain of deciding, should they do it? And if they go through that pain, they'll have all the reasons why they're doing it. And really, that's the starting point, communicating to pensioners and actives as to why they're doing it. Now, that doesn't mean it's, 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 it's going to be easy, far from it. I know there's two people in, this, in, in, in the audience at the moment who are very familiar with a pension scheme I'm very familiar with, where we've reduced a small reduction in pensioners to allow for the levy. We've explained it to everybody but the pensioners are out there protesting. That is the reality of it. So no matter how careful you are in what you're doing, it doesn't prevent one or other groups getting out there and making life difficult. But so be it. That's what trustees have to do. They have to go very carefully assess whether or not it should be done and very carefully explain why. OK. Um, what happens to... I'll put this as a legal question, Lachlan, maybe. Oh, sure, the same communications channels apply, uh, challenges apply to the employer there, do they not? Uh, they do, um, and in some cases more so because it's the employer that, that's going to have to deal with the strike, for example, if the actors fall out, which are... Um, and I, I was struck in Ian's presentation, he was talking about the level of knowledge of the three different people, and it's certainly Eddie that would be the one that you'd be most concerned about. Eddie, who's the, the kind of... The, the, He's the, the guy with a few debts. And no, it was, it was the, 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 the lady who's... Um, oh, yes. ...at you know, 30k, not, not a senior executive, not well-versed in what, what pensions are all about. She, and I, I, I thought Ian's sentence captured it very well. She knows there's a problem with the pension scheme, but she doesn't fully understand the full extent of it. So she doesn't know the risk of things staying in the status quo. She doesn't maybe understand that the employer might have the power to wind it up ultimately. So she doesn't know about balances of powers and she doesn't know about the full invest investments uh, situation. But she does know there's a problem. And if you're trying to sell a change to Eddie and the cohort like her, what you need to do is communicate very, very thoroughly with her the full extent of the problem and then communicate what the options for the solutions are. And again, while it's fundamentally going to be a decision for the trustees most of the time, the employer has to have a role in that because ultimately it's the employer trying to, trying to minimise the cost that's, that's driving a lot of the day-to-day. The -day. Okay, Maureen, a question for you here. Um, lots more questions. What happens to the secured pension if the member leaves the employment? Well, they leave uh, a deferred pension in the scheme. Uh, and as I understand it, if they take early payment of it, you, you're saying that it is of a reduced amount. But otherwise, it stays there as a deferred pension until they get to retirement age. Uh, now, we weren't, uh, it wasn't clarified whether they can take transfer values out, but presumably, if they can take early payment, they, David, they can take transfer it's values. by a secure pension fund, so you could take a transfer value of it, um, or you could transfer it in its form into, in, into a personal retirement bond. Or as Enda mentioned, even for someone who's closer to retirement, uh, they may be able to transfer it or carry it through into an AMRF or an ARF. So it, it, it's portable. OK, I'll read these as they are. Ivan mentioned that resistance to change is not an option. Can the panel comment on the resistance of members and unions to changing from DB to DC and how best they can be brought around to the new DC world? Alan? It's the same communication challenge? It, it, it is, and, and, you know, to pretend it's easy is, it would, 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 be, would be silly. I mean, the reality is that... Um, the trustees have to explain to all parties what they're doing. And in fact, you could take a leaf out of the book of a Section 50, it's the same damn thing. If the trustees are changing the terms of a pension scheme, they've got to decide why they're doing it. They've got to explain to all parties 
why they're doing it. Then they just do it and then take the consequences. The reality is that the fact that you deal with it properly, honestly, and everything else doesn't mean you're going to end up in court. OK, David, how is DC Plus secured pension valued? Are sovereign annuities used? No, it's uh, based on conventional annuities. Uh, so for the reason I explained, you're not allowed to have a deferred annuity product based on sovereign annuity. So it's, it's, it's backed by conventional annuity type pricing. Legal question. Is secured pension under DC Plus subject to statutory revaluation from date of purchase to normal pension date? In a, in a DC scheme? Well, on the DC Plus? No. No. OK, can the panel advise, comment on why the Pensions Board have been so slow to reintroduce the funding standard? Has the credibility of the Pensions Board been damaged by the repeated deferrals uh, of its reintroduction? That's for you, Alan. You're part of the establishment, aren't you? <laughs> All I can say is yes, it has. They have been too slow? I think so, because, and, and it really demonstrates the fact that the longer they take, the more serious the problem is becoming. And I suspect they really don't know what it is they want to do. And I, I, I honestly think that, uh, you know, because there's so many pension schemes out there now, they need urgent attention. And we have no option but to defer the urgent attention until we see what the new rules are. I mean, that's daft. And is that up to the Minister for Social Protection, do you think? I, I would say it's probably up to the Minister to kick the pension board and say, would you ever get the hell and get these rules out fast? Because the, the paralysis won't go away. Lachlan? Yeah. Yeah, I, Maybe take a slightly different view because obviously, yeah, there is a problem with the, the funding standard having been suspended for so long. But particularly with the, the possibility that sovereign annuities might have a significant impact on on deficits uh, and 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 the the extra uh, flexibility that may offer. I, I don't think it's illegitimate for the pension board to have held off for a while while that change and a couple of other possible uh, beneficial changes like the change in priority. Um, that might radically change the, the, the funding landscape in a relatively short space of time. I don't think it was unreasonable for them to hold off for a little while to see what might be on offer to trustees there. OK, uh, here's one for you, David. Can you please speak about fees in DC schemes? It seems to me that in Ireland fees are very high and uh, it is a punitive impact on member schemes. That's from Brian Carr. Thanks for that, Brian. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, Brian. <laughs> Um, yeah, I suppose it had a good go at, on the TV on this uh, a while ago. Um, I suppose everybody would like fees to be lower, but I suppose the one thing, if you look at the data, and I think it's amazing for a small country like Ireland, is that the fees in our defined contribution schemes benchmark very well with those uh, in other countries. So these are much larger economies like the UK, the US and Australia. You know, so for me, standing up here, like obviously we're a provider, uh, but we think the work we do for the fees we charge is, is, is very, very good. OK, surprise, surprise. And uh, <laughs> DC plus... Is this option, this one for you, David, is DC Plus, is this option only open to the wind-up of DB schemes? If so, why? Particularly as DB schemes have option to choose deferred annuity option or go with DC? Uh, no, it's not restricted to wind-up, so it, it could be accessed on a broader basis. And even it could be accessed uh, by defined contribution schemes, like it need not necessarily be restricted uh, to defined benefit schemes. OK, here's a sort of broader question. Should the whole area of pensions between public and private be brought to a level of fairness now that DB is dead effectively? And should this be our industry focus now that the threshold is likely to reduce to 1.5 million? That's more of a political question. Anyone like to take it? I'd, I'd certainly offer, offer a view of two elements there, because that's, that's the second time we've, 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 we've had this notion that DB is definitely dead. I think it's a little bit too early to pronounce DB dead. There's hundreds of thousands of DB members still out there. And while obviously in the future it's going to be a much smaller segment of the pension market, it isn't necessarily the case that it's, it's, it's dead everywhere. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't premise our actions on the assumption that DB is dead. But on the second branch, there is absolutely no doubt that all these changes are putting in a really stark uh, uh, relief, the difference between public sector and private sector pensions, and the, the vast, vastly more valuable uh, uh, promise that public sector workers get than private sector workers. And there is an equity issue and there's a real sustainability issue. And while obviously the government has made some really positive steps, particularly moving towards career averaging for new entrants, that's not going to have an impact for the next 30 years. The crisis is now, the accrued liabilities are enormous, and there are steps the government could take now to make the system more equitable, including shifting to, to DC, uh, or excuse me, to um, 
career averaging for, for future accruals for serving public servants. So that, that is a, a practical step which would be fair, which would be in line with the kind of changes that are happening in the private sector and would have a big impact on the, on, on the cost uh, in the future. Just there was something came up earlier and I had this question prepared. I just wanted to put it to maybe Maureen or, or Alan. Um, the issue of a contingent asset uh, was mentioned this morning. Um, so, David, maybe you'd explain this idea of an employer setting up an escrow account to provide comfort to a pension scheme and its trustees. Yeah, I suppose, like, the basic concept is there's, there's, gov or there's comfort given in some way. So, you know, obviously money has to be ring-fenced in some way. Um, so it's probably more a question for Maureen and Alan just to explain the technicalities well, Alan, of how, that. how do you think trustees would feel about an employee's, employer setting up an escrow account as a contingent asset? Look, I mean, the reality is if the pension scheme is in trouble and the employer can't afford to make good the deficit, we'll clutch at anything, including uh, a, a contingent asset. But it, it's, it's never, you know, totally easy. I mean, we've found in many cases where the employer is in trouble... When we look at an asset, we find that the bank has a first charge anyway, so it's no bloody use. Um, the, 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 the second thing to find is this, if, if you're winding up a pension fund, and you know that seems to be the focus in a lot of cases, let's get out from under our DB and go to DC. Well, if you wind up the DB, by definition, the trustees cease to exist. So by definition, the, the trustees are no longer involved. And the, the, if the property has to be held in escrow, there has to be an escrow trustee. Or, you know, as sometimes has happened, the employer has made a promise which is backed by the security on the asset. So, I mean, the, 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 the short answer is, look, with pension schemes in trouble, anything that helps should be availed. Any legal issues arising from the contingent asset escrow account? Well, mainly that uh, the trustees need a first charge on the assets and many particularly domestic companies, just do not have that kind of asset available. It's come up in funding proposals and funding plans where there have been contingent assets put in, but mostly by subsidiaries of international companies, and not very frequently in the last few years. For that very reason, the assets just are not there. David, why not just buy sovereign bonds instead of sovereign annuities? Um, yeah, certainly that will be an option uh, for schemes, particularly larger schemes, um, and you can, you know, benefit from a lot of the same relief uh, for uh, that you get with sovereign annuities. I suppose sovereign annuities are probably more of an end solution, so for they're for schemes that want to exit out of defined benefit. Um, I think for larger schemes that just want to get relief uh, but continue to run their defined benefit scheme, the sovereign bonds would be maybe well more attractive. Is it unfortunate that the launch of this pro will probably coincide with a referendum? Uh, possibly. Like, uh, certainly a no to the referendum would be bad for this product. Um, but I suppose we've been working on this product for over a year. Uh, like, not that long ago, Irish bond yields were 14%. So it is just amazing uh, how much uh, the country has moved on in a short period of time. And certainly if there's a yes vote to the referendum, like, I think that's going to be another huge step forward for the country. OK, um, maybe one for you, Alan. Uh, MFS standards, when will we know the new rules? <laughs> I wish I knew. Uh, we, 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 we're told that we, we should know them by July. But, you know, we've been told lots of things over the last few months. We've been told to expect lots of things, and every deadline has been met. So I, I, I'm, I'm really not too optimistic at this point. Anyone else want to take that? Do they have any inside track of... I bet usually are in the know, aren't they? <laughs> uh, we, we don't know more than anybody else, which is that the, July pension, is the, the, the pension board hopes to introduce one in the next couple of months. Okay, any of you can take this. Section 50. In all the proposals discussed this morning, will a Section 50 only be required for the wind-up option? Maureen, does that make sense to you? Yeah, <clears throat> Section 50 would usually be used in the context of a funding proposal for an ongoing defined benefit scheme. So you put basically a debt management <clears throat> plan around the the scheme debt to say we can sustain this into the future on this basis but we have to reduce benefits that are accrued and maybe guaranteed increases for pensioners. So it's part of the discussion on change programmes, sustainability of the scheme and these other options that have been discussed today. Okay, question for you. Should the same company be allowed to advise both the employer and the employees and trustees? What's good practice? If, if there's a benign issue, I don't see why not, but inevitably, if there's a shootout on something, unfortunately, you, you can't have the same advisors involved. 
uh, and you're left with, I mean, I'm dealing with one case at the moment where they, with there are advisors to the trustees, there's advisors to the employer, and there's yet another set of advisors to the members. And the only thing I will say about it is the fees are gone through the roof. It adds to cost. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If I can just yes. Also, you will find uh, where the same organisations may be advising, but there are different teams fielded to the different parties. And as long as there are strict, res uh, there are restrictions in place on passing information, the information flow between all those teams. So in other words, they treat each other as if they're in different organisations. Okay, sovereign annuities. Is it currently legal for a pensioner to take a reduced traditional annuity when they have 100% priority? We've yeah. answered that one already. It's, uh, it's um, we're waiting for the pensions board. Yeah, at the point where the pension mm. comes into play, then it is whatever it, it is required under the... Like it is a force scheme. majeure situation in reality. Okay. DC plus presentation assumes 20% uh, calculation. Some of you have having great writing, I might add here. Uh, it, it, surely this is not realistic, David. Uh, something flat pension uh, without widows increases. Uh, what will members... Uh, yeah, ba I think, basically, yeah, is, I think the is point 20%. is it's a high contribution rate, and you know certainly for uh, you know some employers that will be too high a contribution rate, and the numbers obviously wouldn't work out if the employer is paying in lower than that amount. Um, but I suppose the point I made at my start is a lot of employers are paying a lot of money into defined benefit schemes at the moment, and you know are willing to pay significant amounts into defined contribution schemes going forward. You know, so for certain cases, employers will pay 20% uh, into a closed-out population just to exit out of the problem. Okay, can I access sovereign annuities in DC Plus to plug some of the gap between my DB Promise and my secure pension under DC Plus? Yeah, we can't offer it to you at outset, but we could give you the option to convert your deferred conventional annuity to a sovereign annuity at retirement. Please indicate what level of charges, commissions, will apply to new DC Plus products. Um, charges on DC Plus will be in line with our current DC charges. So our typical DC charge is 0.65% fund management charge and uh, a policy fee in the order of 3 to €4 Euro per month. Uh, any advisor fees then are, are deducted or added onto those charges if they're not being paid directly by the employer. OK, maybe one for you here, Alan. Uh, maybe help me out. Under the DC Plus product, if all actives opt for TVs, secured pensions, one... What happens to the existing pensioners of the existing DB fund? Two, will there be a large deficit to refund by the company to cover existing pensioners? Don't quite understand the question, but I think what he's say, saying is that, you know, if, if you do wind up the pension plan and all the members adopt to, are opt to transfer money into the new product, what happens to the pensioners? Well, it makes no difference to the pensioners because if you're winding it up, the pensioners have first priority anyway. And so they get for it. So the only issue for the trustees is are they going to keep the pension fund open or are they going to wind it up? I hazard a guess that if all the actors and deferreds are transferring and you're left with a pension fund with pensioners only, if you have enough money, as you would have to have, to secure the annuities, you just buy them and wind it up and they're secure insofar as it is possible unless you're forced to use sovereign annuities. I'm going to wrap this discussion up and I want to thank all the panel, but just I was speaking to you earlier and we were talking about deficits and so on and the conundrum that you face. You were saying actually changing the retirement age marginally would be a kind of maybe silver bullet solution in some cases? Yes, it is certainly the case. And I think we can't run away from the fact, I mean, any of you watching what's happening in Europe, for example, will have seen the leaked white paper late last year wherein the Commission are proposing to outlaw mandatory retirement ages. And if that happens, that's going to change the landscape. The reality is when we're looking at quite a number of Section 50s, we find that it helps the problem enormously if you can change retirement age, for example, to 65 to 67. And in the light of the changing ages now for old age pension, that would seem to be the logical thing to do. But the surprising thing is a lot of employers are actually hostile to the notion. They would prefer You mean not. they want to get rid of them? 
They, no, they would prefer not to adopt later retirement ages, strangely enough. But I think they're going to have to change because if mandatory retirement ages are outlawed, well, they're going to be stuck with the people anyway. Lachlan, do you see the sense in the point, Alan, is making shifting the goalposts is a clever solution? Well, it's, it's a huge issue for the moment, and we're, we're heading towards a very significant date in about a year and a half. Uh, with the 1st of January 2014, it's going to be very significant because that's the date in which this, the the estate uh, transition pay, uh, pension is abolished. So people at 65 will no longer be entitled to a pension. It'll go up to 66. And you will have a, a very large cohort of people in that year who have a contract that says you retire at 65 who are now not going to get a state pension at 65. And obviously their, their pension, if they have any private pension at all, it's still dependent on the state pension to, 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 to keep them in funds. They're not want, going to want to leave. And even in the absence of any European law on it, there is already a, a, a very... Um, well, significant uh, series of European case law, which says that we, we, we essentially that our legislation, which says you can require a person to retire at a particular age, is not compatible with the with the equal treatment directives. Which means that employers already right now who enforce a retirement age can be at risk. They're probably not at too much of a risk if the retirement age matches a pension age. But the minute you have a, a disconnect between the collecting of the pension and the retirement age, you're in very large danger of successful litigation against you. And that's a really big issue. And that's an issue that's going to have to be resolved over the next year and a half. But that might say, well, then surely all, what we should want to do is keep people in employment longer. There are additional costs to holding on to people, particularly if you envisage any kind of restructuring over the next couple of years, because early retirement and redundancy packages have traditionally been a big element in, in workforce restructuring. That becomes a lot more expensive if the person's end date has moved away by a year or two or three. You're paying them for an extra year or two or three for the gap. So it gets more costly. And it's about 50-50 in the surveys we've done of members. About 50% of members would be happier to see people stay longer to help solve the pension problem. But 50% don't want them staying longer because of the extra potential costs. So there's a, there's a, a couple of issues there to be grappled with. OK, on your behalf, I think Irish Life Corporate Business have assembled a really expert panel. We could go on for hours. We're flat out of time. On your behalf, I'd like to thank Lachlan Deegan, David Harney, Alan Broxon and Maureen Dolan uh, for their uh, direct answers to, to questions. Please show your appreciation. <laughs>